so today we're looking at Matthew 18. So if you have a Bible, you can turn to Matthew 18. If you don't, um, that's okay. I'm gonna put everything that's relevant right here on the screen. Um, if you got it on your phone, you can go there or on a tablet. Uh, if you join us online, you may have another device that you can go on. Matthew 18 is where we're gonna be today. Now, now we're gonna look at a story that um, uh, is gonna seem familiar, but it's gonna seem familiar because you know it from Luke's accounting of it from the Gospel of Luke. Now Matthew gives us a much more abbreviated version and Matthew includes this story for a different reason than Luke does. Matthew includes this story so that it would be a bridge between two really difficult conversations, okay? Um, last week, the really difficult conversation that we looked at was, you remember the disciples came to Jesus? They asked him this question, who's gonna be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And you remember Jesus said, um, you should make sure you're going to make it into the kingdom of heaven first, right? That if you want to even get into the kingdom of heaven, you need to become like one of these children, that the greatest is going to be like these children. And then Matthew tells the story that Jesus tells, and then next week we're going to be looking at um, a really fun passage. It's why we chose it for a holiday weekend on church discipline. Everybody excited? Say, woohoo! Yay! No, no, actually, it, it is actually intended to be a really graceful and kind and loving thing. Uh, but, but there's this parable, this, this story in between these two sections. So let's read it. In Matthew 18, verse 12 is where it's going to be. There you go. You ready? What do you think? So, so just see there, right there, first of all, um, this is connected to the previous story. The disciples come. Who's the greatest? Who's first? Who gets power? Who gets position? And Jesus tells them this parable. If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, will he not leave the 99 on the mountain and go and search for the one that is lost? And if it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that have not gone astray. So it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven for one of these little ones to perish. Uh, these three verses are what's called a parable. Now, a now, really easy way to remember what a parable is, it's a simple story with a single point. A parable is a simple story with a single point. Simple story, single point, right? So, so what's the point that Jesus is trying to make? The disciples come to him concerned with power and position, and Jesus, Jesus, bless him, just isn't. He, he just, he, and he, uh, we're gonna be fair. Here's probably one of the reasons. Jesus doesn't care about position, because he's the king of all of creation, right? He's not concerned with jockeying himself for a better position in the kingdom. He is the ruler over all things are held together by him and for him and through him, scripture says. He's not concerned with power because <laughs> he is God, right? He's not concerned with position or power. He's trying to get the disciples to see something. Because you see, this is what happens with disciples all the time, and it happens with us. Our eyes just begin to wander. We forget what Jesus is really about, what God's really trying to do, and our hearts and our minds just begin to wander, and the disciples get sideways, and somewhere in getting sideways, they think that this kingdom of God thing is about them. They think that them being a disciple, of them being a follower of Jesus. And now think of that in the most literal sense of being one who, sometimes we spiritualize it and we try and break it down and make it all these kind of other things. Think about what the word means to be a follower of Jesus. It means to be someone who follows Jesus. Get that? Let me, let me go back here. We're going to try it again because it's a little complicated. To be a follower means to be someone who follows Jesus. So when Jesus is going this way and the disciples start going this way, go, power, position, look at us, look how amazing we are, who's going to be first? Jesus goes, no, 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 come on, come on. We're going this way, we're going a different direction. And what Jesus is trying to do in this parable is he's trying to redirect the hearts of the disciples and thereby redirect our hearts to what he's really about. Seeking the one, Jesus is far less concerned with his position amongst the 99 than he is concerned with the one that isn't there. In fact, if you look at your Bibles, if you've got one in front of you, um, if you look up above verse 12, right? You look up above verse 12 and you're gonna see verse, some of you are. 
I'm not making this up. Some of you, look at your Bible. Some of you have verse 10. Some of your Bibles don't even have verse 11. If you're working with the New American Standard or an ESV, um, they don't even have. You, now, if it does have verse 11, it's probably going to have it in parentheses. It's probably going to have asterisks. It's probably going to have an underline. It's going to have a circle. It's going to have arrows. Point, it's going to have something to get your attention to point you to a note that says, earliest manuscripts do not have this verse. See, see here's what happened. Several hundred years after scripture was written, translators continued to translate, continued to translate, continued to translate, and it became apparent that the church had forgot what they were about. Does that seem surprising? A bunch of people got lost, right? They forgot what they were about. And, and so the theory is, is that um, verse 11, which isn't actually supposed to be there, but it is in scripture. Verse 11 actually comes, the identical verse 11 comes in Luke 19. Look, this is what it says, Luke 19. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. And so here, here's the leading theory of what's going on here, is that translators began to use Luke 19 as a heading for the story so the people wouldn't get lost or forget what this whole thing was about. Jesus is going to tell, just like if you've got your Bible in front of you, there's a bunch of headings, right? So a little topic headings and all that kind of stuff to help us kind of figure out and remember this is what this story is about. This is where the story is going, the kind of chapter openings, right? Those aren't, just so you know, those aren't written in there by the original authors. Those are written by editors later on. That just like an editor, someone began to write in there, hey, remember this story. This story is about this, that Jesus is a God who seeks and saves the lost. Seeks and saves the lost. This is, Jesus is trying to reorient his disciples' hearts who have become concerned with position and power to say, no, 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 no. I left heaven not because I needed a higher position or needed more power. I left heaven because there was a sheep down in the valley that needed me to chase after him. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Now, today, in any church gathering, whether you're online or in person with us, I think that we probably all would fall into one of three categories when we're looking at the story. Uh, uh, the first one, the first category is this, and you, you decide where you fall. This isn't my decide. You decide where you fall. The first one is this, is, is I think that in this room, watch us online, that there are people who get it, who understand, who, who are following Jesus in every step. When Jesus calls them, you remember this, remember these like really fun verses when Jesus says like, take up your cross. They understand that that's not an option. If they're going to be a follower of Jesus, they're going to take up their cross. That when Jesus says to deny yourself, that when Jesus says to die to self, that you, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you are going to follow Jesus where he leads. And where he leads us to is a, a type of death of our own self, a type of letting the old of us die and a new life being birthed in us. But if we're going to be followers of Jesus, that at the heart of it is a call to sacrifice. And there are some of you who get it, who, who understand, who, who graciously know that it's hard to follow Jesus sometimes. There's this wrestling Paul talks about, about uh, the old and the new in us, that it can be difficult and strenuous. And you don't do it perfect, but you understand that this life isn't about you. That what a disappointing failure of a life would it be to get to heaven and Jesus say, what did you do with everything that I gave to you? And you turn and go, well, look, I, I collected a lot of sand dollars in my life that God's given you. And some of you get that. And, and to you, to you, I just, this morning, this is all I want to say to you. Thank you. Thank you. We celebrate people like Mary because... There are people who get it, who've given their lives to bring glory to their God. And in fact, later on in service, we're, we're going to have an opportunity to do some baptisms because there are some people who get it and have given themselves to loving people to the cross, to Christ. The second group is this. Uh, there, there's, some of, there's some of you who, ju who just don't believe he's good. I mean, you're not going to say it that way. But, but the vision that you have of who God is isn't a God who is good and kind and gracious. It isn't a good shepherd who chases after you. And this is what Luke says, that Luke says that he chases after and he grabs them and he carries them back. 
In fact, um, there's, there's a passage in Ezekiel 34, because you remember, well, one of the things we talk about when we're studying the book of Matthew that's incredibly important, changes everything about how we read this book, is that Matthew is a Jew. Okay, second time, it's going to be the same answer, just as a heads up. Let's say it loud enough so the online audience can hear it. Okay, you ready? Here we go. And he's writing to a bunch of Jews. There you go. Matthew's a Jew, and he's writing to a bunch of Jews. So there are things that we see in the passage that they may not have seen because 2,000 years ago, we're 21st century Americans, very distinct worldview. And there are things in the passage they would have seen that, that we wouldn't. And I'm convinced that when they would have read this, they would have thought of Ezekiel 34. Now, most of Ezekiel 34 is not pleasant, but there's a section in the middle of Ezekiel 34. Look at this passage. It says this. Let me read it to you. And see if this doesn't sound a little bit about like what Jesus is saying. For the Lord God said this, behold, I myself will search for my sheep, right? Jesus, does this sound familiar? And look after them as a shepherd for his flock on a day when he is among his scattered sheep. So I will care for my sheep and I will rescue them. Sound familiar? Seek and save. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the streams and all the inhabited places of the land. I will feed them in a good pasture, and their grazing place will be on the mountain heights of Israel. Sound familiar? 99 up on the mountain, right? There they'll lie down in good grazing place and feed in rich pastures on the mountain of Israel. I myself will feed my flock and I myself will lead them to rest, declares the Lord. I will, look at this, look at this Luke 19, 10. I mean, this is right here. I will seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken and strengthen the sick. This is the heart of, of the message of the gospel that we celebrate, is that we serve and worship a God who's chased after us, who's cha- whose love is so overwhelming that he will go to any extent. I mean, just think about this. Uh, uh, let me ask you to think of something that God would knew, to need to do to demonstrate that he loves you. Uh, think of the most wild thing that you could think of that God could do to demonstrate that he loved you. Here's what scripture says, the way he demonstrated he loved you. He gave himself. Like what more could God give? In fact, scripture says that that if he gave his own son, what more would he not give for you? That Jesus, so overwhelmed with love for you, gave himself for you. And maybe today, Maybe today, maybe in a season, you've been in a season, it's been months or years of, you know, what Ezekiel says at the beginning of a cloudy and gloomy day. And maybe, maybe now you're in a place where, you know, you thought, I never thought my life would end up here. Ten years ago, I never thought things would look like this. When I was a kid, I never thought things would look like this. But the message of the gospel, the good news that we celebrate is that God is good and chasing after you. That today, in this moment, you're here, you're online, you're wherever you are because God is after you. You may not even yet realize it, that God is after your soul. In fact, let me tell you the story. Um, I got a friend, he's a pastor in Chicago, and his family um, was vacationing in the coastal Carolinas. And, and they had, you know, aunts and uncles, cousins, they were kind of all a big group, we're all camping together on the coast in, um, in the Carolinas. And uh, I've never been there, but as he describes it, uh, in this area, there's a beach, and th- that's where kind of like all the playgrounds and the shops and the stores and all that kind of stuff, and people camp on this beach section. Um, and then there's a huge hill of sand that's been artificially constructed to create kind of a surge wall, right? So they have hurricanes, they have, you know, tropical storms, they have big windstorms, and, and, and they blow in and they built this big huge berm of sand so that when those things did push in, they just hit the berm and they protected the city, right? So people camp on the, we'll, we'll call it the continental side, okay? On the continental side of this big berm, and then you just, you walk over the top of the berm, and you go down and you go play in the ocean. It's right there. You go play and have fun. And then you walk back over the other side. And then you can sleep at night not worried if like a big tsunami wave is going to come up and wash you out into the ocean. Right? 
So they're all there, and, and you know, the kids are all playing, and, and as kids do, they all want to go down to this playground that's down the beach a little ways. And it's on the continental side of the berm, and so all the families say, okay, okay, yeah, 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 you guys can all go, but hey, hey, you're 12, you keep track of everybody else. I think that's legal, okay? You keep track of everybody else. And they send them away, and they all go down to go play on this playground. And they're down there for a while, and the parents are just relaxing and enjoying the quiet, can I get an amen, right? And all of a sudden, all the kids come back, except for one. His six-year-old daughter isn't with the group. And you can imagine the panic. Can you? I mean, if you've had children, it's, it's not hard to imagine. If you haven't had children, it's probably not hard to imagine either. You're 100 feet from the beach and your six-year-old daughter's missing. You're 100 feet from waves crashing that could easily carry out to sea effortlessly. And she's missing. So they scatter. They run. I mean, and run like the wind. You know, it's one of those kind of panic runs where like you, somehow you just don't get out of breath. Have you ever had one of those moments where you, can, you could run for de- just adrenaline? It's, it's the kind of where like moms flip cars off of people. It's that kind of adrenaline, right? And he goes running south down the beach and his wife goes running north up the beach and it doesn't take long before he sees her out in the distance and she's just playing because she doesn't even realize she's lost yet. And he's screaming at the top of her lungs for her. And he runs up to her screaming. And, and his screaming and his crying, uh, like just rejoicing seeing her, he starts weeping. She panics. So she starts crying. And he grabs his daughter and he squeezes her. He grabs hold of her. And then he has this thought. Mom still thinks she's missing. Mom's still panicked up the, up the beach, screaming for her daughter. And so he takes her and he carries her and he runs with every ounce of effort he has to get her back to her mom. This is the gospel. That Jesus came running after us and some of us didn't even realize we were lost when he came running up to us. And he grabbed hold of us and he said, I've got to get you back to your daddy. In fact, in Luke, when he tells this parable, Luke says that um, he finds him and he picks him up and he carries him. Some of you today, some of you today need to allow God, a good and gracious God, to be God and to carry you. Say, God, I'm a busted mess. I can't figure this stuff out. I, look, look, look at how my life looks when I've tried doing it. God, I need you and to trust that he's good and kind and gracious. And, and here, I'm going to be honest, here's one of the reasons it's hard to believe that God is good and kind and searching us out, wants to grab us and wants to hug us and, and rejoices. You want to know why it's hard to believe that? Because if I was looking for me, are you with me? If I was looking for me, I'd be coming at me with a rolled up newspaper. Amen? Anybody else? No, 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 no. Not if you were looking for me, if you were looking for you. Right? If you were looking for you, would you not? What are you doing out here? Did I not build you a fence? Was the fence not big enough? You felt like you had to knock it over. You thought you knew better, yet now you're out here in the bush. Do you, do you not? Un- I'd be back there beating me some pork chop. <laughs> right? Get back in the pen. But, it, but that's not the God we serve. He runs to his child and he grabs him. He says, I found you. And it says, there's great rejoicing. There's great rejoicing over you. One. One. In fact, there's a passage in Romans I really like. I especially like the way the Amplified Version says it. It says this, because it's just kind of a little blunt straight at us. It says this, are you actually unaware? Or I wanted to put in there just ignorant, right? But it doesn't say just, it just is ignorant. Are you unaware or ignorant of the fact that God's kindness, God's kindness leads you to repentance? It's God's kindness that should draw us to him. But there's a third group. And I think it might be the most prevalent group in churches today. Here it is. You're just bored. Can we be honest? Like you busy your life. You keep your schedule really busy because otherwise you recognize how bored you are. Isn't it amazing, even in the midst of a pandemic last year, how anxious we got about not being busy? 
Like we talk about, oh, I appreciate all the space and time. It just lets me breathe and be with family. We went on a nice walk. But I'd re- I'm really looking forward to when things get busy again. And I can fill my, because we're just bored. We're just bored. In fact, look, look, at, look, at, look at where the other um, uh, 99 are. Did you, did, you, did you see it? I underlined it just in case you didn't, right? Look where Jesus says they are. He left the 99 on the mountains. Here's why I think a lot of us are bored. Because we think that what it means to be a follower of Jesus is to find like a little bit better tasting grass. I mean, like the grass that we've been eating, like Jesus saved us and he drew us up on this mountain and and he said, here, there's enough to sustain you forever. You have whatever you want. And we had the grass and we're like, oh, this is amazing life. And there was a time when we were excited and maybe even on fire. And all we wanted to do was like read our Bible. But there came a point where we're like, I mean, is there any better grass Maybe, maybe there's different grass. Maybe if we go around this other side of this hill, maybe there'll be a Bible study, I mean grass, um, that, that will taste a little different. Maybe, maybe, oh, I've never had alfalfa. You know, maybe if we had some alfalfa grass, like that would, maybe, you know, maybe there's a different stream, some different water, you know, because, uh, you know, that water, it was great, it was good, but you know, it's, it's not quite cold enough anymore. It doesn't quite hit my palate the right way. Maybe maybe if I climb up on this rock, I can get a different view, a more beautiful view. Maybe I can climb up on that rock and I can take a little Instagram picture and I can go hashtag blessed, right? And a lot of us are bored. A lot of us are bored because we're just chasing around trying to find the next high. We're bored because we're sitting up on top of a mountaintop that we were never meant to stay on. Eating grass and getting fat, while Jesus, you remember, follower of Jesus, you remember where Jesus is? Jesus isn't on the mountain, Jesus is in the valley, Jesus is in the briar bushes, Jesus is amongst the enemy, Jesus is amongst the wolves, chasing after the lost sheep. See, a lot of us are bored, because we're bored eating the same grass sitting on top of a hill and we think that maybe if we just learned one more detail about the Bible or we went to one more Bible study or we sang one more worship song that it might revitalize something in us and bring us something new and fresh. But here's why we're bored because here's the deal. You, you, you have a choice. You can either be on the mountain or you can be on mission. You can be on the mountain and Jesus will let you be there all the rest of your days savoring and enjoying the best of his goodness. Or you can get down in the valley and get down in the darkness and get dirty and get ugly and have to sacrifice and get burrs in your hooves and, and, and stuff in your fur and get nasty and have nights where you hear creaking and noises in the night that you're unsure about, but you're there with Jesus. You can be on the mountain or you can be on mission. Let me explain it to you this way. Um... If I, if I was to invite you over for dinner, let, let's, let's just imagine. I'm not going to. Don't get excited. Um, but let's say I was going to invite you over for dinner, okay? Here's kind of how it would work, right? Um, we, we'd set a time and we'd set a date and we'd be like, hey, yeah, woo, we're so excited. Come over at 530. And then we go, click, and we go, we got to clean everything up. Anybody else? Anybody else? That pile of stuff on the counter, right? Got to hide that stuff. Right? Um, I I, I learned a a nice little hack. The the internet is good for some things. If you need to hide a bunch of stuff on short notice, just get yourself a hamper, right? And then just sweep everything into the hamper and then hide the hamper in the closet. Now, what the hack said is that when people leave, go back and get the hamper and then actually put the things away. I don't like that part of the step. So I just put things into the hamper and the next time someone comes over, I have to find another empty hamper. So I'm investing in hamper stock because I have a lot of hampers. And so if you're gonna come over, we're, we're gonna clean. We're gonna clean everything. We're gonna sweep. We're gonna clean the bathroom because the bathroom you use, you share with our children. So we're gonna clean the bathroom. Um, We're going to clean the counters. We're going to, everything's going to get beautiful and clean and perfect. And then you know what I'm going to do? Probably 24 hours ahead of time, I'm going to go to the store and I'm going to find me some ribs. Because man, like if you're going to come over and eat, we might as well eat like we're dying tomorrow, right? 
No reason not to, right? And so I'm gonna get some ribs. I'm gonna get some good ribs, some good ribs, some good pork ribs, right? And, and then I'm gonna season them. We're gonna get some salt on them. We're gonna season. We're gonna get them all wrapped up in saran wrap. And we're gonna get them in the fridge so they can just kind of sit there and, and and work with each other, right? Have a little party in the fridge, right? And 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 then the next day I'm gonna I've got a, a side by smoker on my barbecue deal thing. I'm gonna get some smoke rolling in that thing. Like good, clean smoke, not ashy smoke. You don't, want, you don't want to taste ash when you're eating pork ribs. Do you know that? You don't want to taste that. You want like good, clean smoke. And so we're going to get some good, clean smoke going. We're going to get that meat out, and we're going to get it right on the barbecue. And we're going to give it about 30, 45 minutes of good, clean smoke. That first part of the smoke is really important. You didn't know you came for cooking advice. It's really important. Low temp, and we're going to go low and slow, and it's going to be hours, hours of just low, slow beautiful pork cooking. You're going to start to see the meat kind of peel off the bone to where the bone's going to stick out the other side, maybe just about a half an inch, right? It's going to be awesome. And then there's going to come a point, I'm going to take them off, I'm going to wrap them up, and we're going to let them rest, because you've got to let them rest. The greatest defense of any meat eating is to take some off the grill and just eat it. You've got to let it rest. Let it rest. If it's good enough to cook it, it's good enough to let it rest, Okay. So you're going to let it rest, and then you're going to come over to our house, and we're going to cook everything else up. You're going to knock on the door, and, and you're, you're going to be standing at the door. And just so you know, when you talk bad about us standing on our front porch, we have a ring doorbell. Like, we can hear you talking about us, right? And then we're going to open the door. We're going to act like we didn't hear what you said about us. And we're going to say, hey, we're glad you're here. We're going to take your coat. We're going to hang it up on the, the thing. We're going to, come on, come on, come on back. The food's ready. It's perfect. It's, oh, it's awesome. And we're going to sit you down at the table, and, and everything's going to be ready. Plate's going to be out. Drinks are going to be out. Everything's going to be ready. We're going to sit. And, and then you might do this, okay? You might do this. You might go, right? In, in the restaurant industry, we call this rubbernecking, right? You're going you're to start, like, looking for some, and I'm going to notice it. And I'm, I'm going to go like this. Oh, oh are, are you missing something? And you're going to go, Oh, I, I, I don't have a fork. And I'm going to go, you eat ribs with a fork? Get out of my house. <laughs> no, no, that's actually not how it's going to go. Um, but that's what I'm going to think in my head, okay? Um, but I'm going to go like this. I'm going to go, oh, I'll get you a fork. And you'll go, no, 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 just tell me where the fork's on. I'm going to go, no, no, no. I'm going to get you a fork. And I'm going to get up from the table, and I'm going to go get you a fork, and I'm going to give you a fork. And you're going to sit, and you're going to, oh, oh, like a heathen, eat ribs with a fork right? And you're going to eat these ribs up, and they're going to be amazing. They are. It's your imagination. Just a mat. They're going to be amazing. And then when we're all done, there's going to be just a massacre of bones sitting on the table. And, and I'm going to say, hey, why don't you come out in our backyard? Let's, let's, go, let's go hang out. And we're going to pull out cornhole. You know, cornhole, it's that table thing with the little ball thing, and you're going to throw the bean bag. Um, and, and we're going to play cornhole, and, and then you're going to leave, hopefully before eight o'clock, because I love you, but not that much. Okay? And so you're going to leave, and then I hope the next week you're at work and someone says this to you. Someone says, hey, would you, how'd your weekend go? What, would you? Oh, man. I had some ribs. <laughs> Woo! Now, I ate them with a fork, so that's kind of uncouth. But I had some ribs, right? And then you're going to go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, my pastor, whew, cornhole, killer. I mean, that dude is a freak of nature. Amazing. Like the most impressive human being I've ever met in my life. And if you're not thinking that, this is my dream. Leave me alone, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> I got all excited. I forgot where I was going. Okay, here we go. <laughs> um, no, no. But, it, but here's the deal, Okay. I hope you have a great meal. I hope you have a great evening. I hope you love every minute of it. But you're not part of the family. Because you know what the family's gonna do? You're gonna leave. And the family's gonna go back inside and we're gonna do the dishes. And we're going to wrap up all the food and we're going to put the leftovers away and we're going to clean everything. And we're going to wipe off all the counter. We're going to sweep everything. And we're going to put it back just the way it was before. Because if you're part of the family, you're going to get a broom and you're going to get a towel and you're going to wipe the counter. And you're going to clean up the food and you're going to cook the food. And, and here, here's the problem. Is a lot of us are bored because we treat Jesus and we treat church and we treat following Jesus like a restaurant. And we show up to a place expecting to be fed, enjoying a meal. And I hope here, let me just, let me just tell you as honestly as I can. I hope that you leave here. I hope you leave here every Sunday and you go, oh man, there, there's a song. 
There was this moment in the song, and it was awesome. There was this video, and it was, it was powerful. That There was this preacher, and it was subpar. But there was this moment with baptism at the end, and it was awesome. And I hope you tell people that it was awesome. But as long as you show up just to eat a meal and go home, you will be bored and a guest at the table of God. But until you pick up a rag and wipe a table, until you stack a chair, until you serve, until you give, until you give your life to making that guest table crowded, you'll be bored. You'll be bored. And you'll always be looking for another hillside of grass, another stream or another view that might spark something new. All the while, Jesus is inviting you down into the trenches where brokenness exists, where darkness is, so that you can be a part of eternal life change in souls. So the question for you today is this. Are you bored? Get a rag. Get a broom. Give yourself to serving so that the dinner table of God will be crowded with lost sons and daughters.